Oh, DEI, DEI, DEI. The right has been constantly attacking DEI programs, which is their latest attack on black folks. It was CRT, it's affirmative action, it's quotas, it's diversity. I mean, it goes on and on and on, and it frankly, it's all anti-black. They're also bolstered by the Supreme Court's decision banning affirmative action in colleges and universities, and they've been using that to go after everything, which I told y'all this stuff was coming down. I've been talking about since 2009, wrote about it in my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. And so now what you have is a, an attack on medical schools. You've been hearing the language. Oh, my goodness. Uh, conservatives like Dave Rubin, R Rubin people are going to be dying uh, because we're letting these unqualified folks, these DEI hires in. Hmm. Do, do they say anything about when people uh, have been injured or died at the hands of white doctors? No, I don't think so. Well, Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton, of course, University of Virginia anesthesiologist. She is, she looked fired up. So she was posting some comments over the weekend. She sent me a text. She was like, bro, I got to come on. I was like, Ebony, you're always welcome on the show. So, Doc, glad to have you. It's been a while since we've had you on. Glad to see you. So um, you have not been happy with these folks. Take it away. Right. I mean, it's one of these things. It's the same tired, um, how do you say, rhetoric that we've had for generations of where it is a blame black people for the lack of progression of our individual selves that racists seem to um, center on. And if we really don't look at, you know, who benefits from DEI efforts in the first place, it's been the same thing since the women's suffrage back in the 1920s. The greatest benefactor of any type of affirmative action has always been and will continue to be white women. But in this discussion of who we should limit and keep out of the, the halls of the hospital, we're continuously pointing the finger at black people as if we're overwhelming the system in the first place. In fact, if you look at it, of all physicians, black women, we only make up 2%, 2% of the doctors. So these racist people that are screaming out, limit the DEI, they are literally punching air because who are you talking about that's taking your spot? Also, when we talk about this idea of DEI, go to my iPad. I mean, look, it's a part of the healthcare industry. Uh, this is from USA Today within medical schools. DEI is a broadly accepted part of basic training for quality care. We cannot deny the reality of, frankly, medical apartheid, uh, how black folks have been treated separately uh, from others. And so it's important to teach these things to get non-minority doctors to understand that you cannot bring your, frankly, your biases to the table when you are assessing patients. We know when it came to even, uh, I mean, early on racism, actually help black people in the sense of the opioid crisis because early on doctors were not prescribing black folks the powerful opioids because they said, oh, they must be here trying to get their fix in. So they were prescribing Tylenol where they were giving the white folks uh, all the other different drugs. And so they start dropping dead left and right. I remember I gave a speech and I said, wow, the one time racism actually helped black people for a while. Right. And, you know, we can talk about the problem um, that black people face. And then we can also talk about the impact that diversity has had on the medical field in general. The problem black people face, for one, we're, we're nearly twice as likely to die from any kind of preventable heart disease, preventable heart disease. If you're between the ages of 45 and 54 years old and you're black, you're three times more likely to die from a stroke than if you're white. We can talk about cervical cancer and breast cancer and how black women are two times more likely to die from cervical cancer. We saw Jessica Pettiway, 36 years old. Life is over, right, from misdiagnosis from cervical cancer. We can talk about breast cancer and the fact that black women have higher death rates in every single state of the United States of America. We can talk about prostate cancer and black men being twice as likely to die from prostate cancer than if they were white. And Dr. Martin Luther King's youngest son, 62 years old, just died from prostate cancer. So we can talk about all these, these devastating things. And we can also talk about the benefit of why that means that we need more black people in the medical field. For instance, if we're looking at infant mortality, right? We know that one in every 90 black children, one in 90, will die before their first birthday. 
we bury them. But if you are a black mother in a Florida study of 1.8 million births, if you are a black mother and you had a black daughter or doctor, your child's likelihood of dying was cut in half. That, that is huge in itself. And then there was other studies looking at 16,000 or 1,600, sorry, um, counties that showed that if you had an increase in just 10% of black physicians present, that you would increase mortality or your, your, your length of life by at least 30 days. These are the things that we are not talking about, of how black people and black doctors help to keep black people alive. And it's not just about race. Again, we're looking at the greatest benefactors of the DEI movement. It has been women in totality, right? But if you look at women in the surgical field, there was a study looking at over 1.5 million um, cases. And what they saw was that if you had women taking care of patients instead of men, 32,000 people would be alive at the end of the year in addition to what we already have, right? And then our surgical patients, it showed that of a million cases, if you had a female surgeon, you were 25% less likely to die than if you had a male surgeon. So when we have these you know, opponents come in and say, we should limit DEI and we should keep the underrepresented minorities out of medicine, what they are literally translating that to is that we can increase death and morbidity and mortality because we know those people and that diversity helps to keep people alive and reduce complications. Uh, and you have a member of Congress uh, who has been talking about this, and he's supposed to still address uh, a, a health organization, uh, and you're not too happy about that. At all. That's Dr. Murphy. First of all, Dr. Murphy is a urologist. And if we look in 2018, they showed that of the 11,000 urologists that are around, right, that only 262 were black. 11,000 and 262. Again, these people are punching air because who are you mad about that's taking your seat? And Dr. Murphy, for instance, I think he, he entered in medical school in 1980, 85. Um, we have to remember Tuskegee experiment didn't end until 1972. So there were not a lot of black people in your medical school class anyway. That tells you how long we still have a lag in catching up to the numbers that we deserve because we should be a reflection of the population that we serve because we are public servants. And we are medical providers. Uh, questions from the panel. Let's see here. Uh, Tyler, you're first. Yeah, I, I would I would echo your words. I think thank you for your, your leadership on this. And I think, you know, it's shocking, but it's not, you know, uh, it's shocking to see with with it all the rhetoric that we've, we've been seeing with DE and I it has been just ongoing, and I think as you mentioned before, diversity amongst physicians leads to better health outcomes for patients, and it leads to health equity and closes disparities. Uh, what can folks do to, to com like to combat this? We you know we see it at the in Congress is more of a message bill, but this can be a trickle down effect uh, into states states across the country. What can folks do to ensure uh, that they're their schools and communities are safe. Right. I, I think one thing that we can do is we literally can say, hey, we are black people and we're paying our taxes that go to fund these public, these, these federally backed um, health insurance policies, Medicaid, Medicare. And if we know that our outcomes are better when we have physicians that look like us, that talk like us, whether that's our language, uh, uh, our native tongue, if they have our same religion, right? If they have our same sexual orientation, if they have our same gender, if they have our same race, if we know that they have better outcomes and that I am more likely to be alive, then this needs to be a federal policy and not one of these things where we're deeming um, you know, the, the public's feelings of which most of these people don't even have a medical degree to begin with. They have not taken the MCAT to begin with. And they're yet telling people who are qualified and who are not qualified to be in those positions. And so I think we need to start doing that. We need to start tying policies um, related to whether or not this is a civil rights issue. If we are dying more, shouldn't more be done to keep us alive? We are tax paying citizens. We are citizens at, at large. Shouldn't there be something that looks at and holds accountable the institutions that we are turning our lives over to? If we look at the numbers for the hospital, for the department, down to the individual provider, and it is showing that you have a racial health disparity and you're not showing how you are tackling those racial health disparities, then you should not be afforded federally backed dollars. That just does not make sense. Are you, are you actually trying to say the pro-life people actually care about black lives? 
<laughs> right. Derek, your question. Dr. Hilton, I really appreciate your, your work in this area. Um, so mine's is sort of twofold because we got the systemic challenges that we're dealing with here in Georgia. I'm right in Atlanta, where 82 counties out of 159 counties do not have an OBGYN. 61 counties out of 159 do not have a pediatrician. So how do we combat the structural challenges? But then there is a disinformation. As you were breaking it down, the facts, Georgia, depending on which ranking you look at, we're number 47, 48, or 49 when it comes down to uh, maternal and infant mortality. Uh, 169 women died just simply trying to bring you know life into this world. Uh, in Georgia, 776 children die, just simply try to become part of our population. And so how do we combat disinformation and misinformation when we are trying to give facts in our Georgia General Assembly down here and at the same time in the black community build trust? Because we noticed during COVID, uh, because of the misinformation and disinformation, um, that trust factor really uh, plays an a, a impact on the things that we could or could not do during COVID. Right, you know, and you bring up great points. One, access, and then the, the misinformation or, or the, the stigma that's placed on Black people, too, that the reason why we don't engage in medical conversations is because of, of one, just simply mistrust, and or for two, that we don't want to be compliant with recommendations. But I think what we see, if we particularly look at COVID, once black people were actually allowed to get the vaccine, because we do have to remember there was a phase out process of when the vaccines were allowed to the public, right? And in the very first time, it was for medical providers, of which only 16% of, of um, medical providers are black. And that's including nurses, that's including nurses tech on down, right? Um, and then it went to a long age group and it said, well, if you're 75 and older, um, of which we know that of all Americans, 65 and older, only 9% are black. So automatically they wrote us off as being able to be available to have the, uh, are eligible to have the vaccine in the first place. It really wasn't until the summertime of 2021 that black people in large were able to get vaccinated unless those persons had severe heart disease, diabetes, had some form of cancer. Basically, you had to enter into 2020 with at least one of your organs dead and or gone, or you had to be a doctor in order to get vaccinated if you were black, largely in the United States of America. But what you bring up is a very good point, though, as far as listening to the voices of black people and getting them the resources that they need. What we saw with COVID, in addition to the misinformation and the, the lack of access to vaccines, the two big hurdles that we had to go through, was that there were no hospitals within our communities. Literally, there were mobile vans behind the, the grocery store. There were in the parking lots of the barbershop and the church, um, in the, the, the church communion hall, right? Those are where we had to show up in order to get vaccinated. And when the COVID pandemic was quote unquote over, those mobile vans disappeared. There was not one brick laid to establish a new clinic within those um, neighborhoods and those communities that we knew were dying at five to six times the rate of other community members right down the street. And so what I again urge black people to do is we know that health is political, unfortunately. We can say, you know, health and politics are two separate things, but it absolutely is not. And in Georgia in particular, we see the power of the vote and what you can do when we turn out in numbers. And I know it's difficult because they try to disenfranchise us, but again, you pay tax dollars. So why is it that you're taking money out of my check every month that I could be using to feed my children and yet my children don't have a pediatrician within their community? Why is that? Why is it with, with the development of telehealth, why is it that every single public school at this point doesn't have telehealth um, capabilities of where a pediatrician can dial in and view my child while they're still in school and one, reduce the likelihood or the need for me to get off of work, right? And also, prescribe the medication so they can get treatment right then and there. Why is why are we not doing that? We have absolutely the means to do it, but in America, because of the people that are in place, in power, have never had the, 
the kind of the consequence of what a disparity looks like. They don't live check to check. They've never had an issue of, of availability of a provider because they're afforded one, right? Um, we have to look at that because it can, even with the best of persons, put a blinder up where you don't see the obstacle that everyday Americans are having to face. But when that blinding leads to the death of black people, where we are now dying at younger ages than two and three generations ago, that is now a problem that we have to reconcile with and America needs to do better. And Ebony, the reality is when we look at uh, I mean, the, the numbers are the numbers. I mean, I don't care what category. Um, it's not like, oh, we're doing great in any one particular area in the medical field. It, it, it's true. I mean, from again, if you look at the leading causes of death, 12 of the 15 leading causes of death, black people have higher rates at younger ages. I mean, we can look at Chadwick Boseman, right? We can we can look at Dexter Scott King. We can look at Jessica Pettyway. We can look at near deaths too, though. We can look at Serena Williams. We can look at Beyonce mm -hmm. and their complications with pregnancy. It's not only the ones of us who die that is an issue. That's a major issue. But it's also the ones of us that are living with the consequences of the near misses. And again, when we're living in the United States of America, where we're able to to donate money to all these other countries, right? And we can, we're able to, as you were saying in your, your previous segment, point at other countries and call them shithole countries. But we don't take a second to look within and wonder why we still don't have clean water in Flint, Michigan. And that was back in 2014. While we still have not all the power in, in Puerto Rico, right? How are we able to have these issues where we turn a blind eye to the to the best most vulnerable populations when again these are tax paying citizens and i'm not saying that taxes are everything but what i do know is that it takes money to run these programs and we with every single cent that comes out of your check are funding these programs we're funding these hospitals and therefore they need to serve us and that's how we start to really think about the i feel we should start to think about the black lives matter movement because like Dr. Martin Luther King said, of all forms of inequality, it's injustice in health that's the most shocking and most inhumane. We lose far more people at the hands of medicine and the lack of resources and the misdiagnosis that happened and, and the, the lack of accountability when things go wrong within our community than we would ever do with the police system. But yet the, the call for reform is simply not there in the, in the voice and the strength that it is when we see the happenings of Philando Castile and, and George Floyd and Sandra Bland, things that definitely need spotlighting. But Jessica Pettyway, she also deserves to be spotlighted. Yep, absolutely. And so you have been sounding the alarm. So we appreciate it. And of course, as I said, you're welcome anytime. But I can't let you go yet because I was... On social media uh, yesterday, and I came across this tweet right here. Um, City girls, y'all had your run, but 2024 is for us hashtag country girls. First Beyonce and Cowboy Carter goes number one, and now South Carolina Gamecocks go number one. Let's go. So uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and gloat for the country girls right now. T I see Tyler. Tyler, what's this? You got a, Tyler, you got... The orange, what? Uh, you an Astros fan, Tyler? Look, I, look I, I, I've just got my my uh, my cowboy Carter on, you know, celebrating the Beyonce. So, okay, all right then. Uh, well, uh, well, Ebony, uh, you, you 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 and your fellow country girls feeling yourselves, huh? I mean, as we should. I mean, again, we have the number one album out. Um, this is global. It's not within just within the United States of America. And then I'm not sure if you all saw, but the game cost did shut it down. And that is a very young team. So we're not going anywhere. Um, I am from Little Africa, South Carolina. Please look us up. So, yeah, hmm. I, I was very much um, not only clapping, right. but I felt like I was in the stands. Yes. That was uh, Gavin, you trying to say something? Well, I was going to say I didn't get to ask my question, Roland. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I thought I'd uh, go ahead. What's your question for uh, Ebony? You're good. Dr. Hilton, thanks for joining us. I want to just thank you for all that you're doing, the service you're providing to your community, the platform, uh, how you're using your platform. I mean, I just I just give you a follow on Twitter. I'm excited to stay engaged. Um, and I want to thank you on behalf of all the, the young future black uh, doctors who are out there who are watching you do what you do uh, and, and feel inspired uh, by it. 
folks like my little sister who uh, is about to start dental school. I'm very proud of her. Um, but I wanted to ask you, taking a step back and thinking about how we can build the pipeline of black doctors um, in medicine. I know from friends of mine who are in the field, or like I said, my little sister, that there are a lot of barriers, right, that stand in the way of, of, uh, of students uh, making it to medical school. Academic barriers, obviously, but also some financial barriers, you know, whether it comes to you know, the MCAT test prep or paying to actually take the MCAT or paying for your application fees, your secondary fees. Um, how can we remove some of these barriers? Are there policies? Should the medical schools be doing more? Are there scholarships out there for students who might be listening? Uh, just want to get your take on how we can make, how we can, how we can reduce these financial barriers that stand in the way of so many of our young, potentially future doctors, you know, making that crossover into medical school. You know, that's a great question. And congratulations to your sister. Um, you know, it's one of those things I, too, I didn't come from a medical family. My parents, they didn't graduate from high school. I mean, it, it really was a learned process of how do I even apply for this, this and this? What do you mean there's an MCAT? Um, but I was very fortunate to have people placed in my path that when I had a question um, that I could go to them and say, can you just show me how? Because I know I'm more than capable. And that's the thing. Of all the degrees that you see behind me, um, truly my greatest degree is my lived life experience because that can't be taught in a book. And it will make you, for those young people who are, who are watching me thinking, you know, I don't know what it takes to be a doctor. Because you've lived it, you absolutely then there under, therefore understand what are the obstacles that are placed in the way a person's trying to get and, and receive access to medicine. And therefore you are exactly who we need to be there. So as far as what you can do to get um, medical resources and financial resources, I actually, this was probably about 10 years ago at this point, I made a YouTube video explaining just what you should do if you're a pre-med student, how do you get your letters of recommendation? What are some research projects you can do? How do you strengthen your application? What are some summer undergraduate research programs that are offered at all these different institutions? And also, where are some free MCAT prep programs? It's on um, my YouTube channel, of which, again, I only have like two videos. Do not look at it for that because that's not what it was for. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but it was, um, EJ Hilton, um, I think is my at Gmail. I don't know. I don't do YouTube. But the point <laughs> being, I will try to get it um, to uh, to Roland so he can post it. But underneath that video in the caption, you can see all these links of where you can go and get these resources. Because I do believe w there are so many brilliant black children that are in these communities that are oftentimes overlooked because we're title one. Right. That was me getting free lunch in, in elementary school. I, I lived that life. And because of that, that's why I know that there's no hospital within those communities because there's still no hospital within my community that I grew up. And that's why I am so vocal when I speak out to say that those people, my family, their, their lives matter. And I can see the difference in the resources that are afforded to me now that I live in, in a higher income neighborhood than what I was when I was a child who was just as brilliant, just as just as capable, just as eager to contribute to my community and to my country, but I wasn't giving the, the access, um, right? I had to go and actively try and be on this treadmill proving to everyone on and on from every great level that yes, I can do this. And what it led to was me getting three degrees in four years while working two jobs, graduating with honors, going on to medical school, graduated top of my class, and then going on to be the first at every single institution I've worked at so far, the first and only black person to work at that institution in my, mm -hmm. in my specialty. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be that way. I am proud to say that since I've worked at those institutions, they've at least tripled the number, which means only mm -hmm. three, but still, but still being very vocal that it is not right that we continue to allow for the exclusion of persons who who are beneficial, not, not just because they're there, but they literally take better care, they reduce the morbidity, they redu reduce the mortality, meaning they reduce the complications and the likelihood that patients die. That's why we are needed. Well, uh, look, y'all, I tried during COVID to get uh, Ebony to do more videos, and she and her uh, partners uh, with their uh, health practice in South Carolina, they do some videos. I tried, y'all. I tried. 
So uh, maybe maybe we'll try uh, uh, Ebony Jade Hilton YouTube 2.0 uh, in 2024. <laughs> right. right. What, what we'll you, try. We'll have to bring you to, uh, to video boot camp. All right. <laughs> Always good to see you, Ebony. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits.